Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 to 6 is our portion of scripture we're reading today from the King James Bible. I greet you in the wonderful name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many years ago, a pastor of mine said to me that all of life's solutions to man's problems are found in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is like the book of psychology for man and for his soul. In fact, if you look at a passage of scripture like Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. The heart of man, Jeremiah 17, 9 reminds us that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And out of it flows the issues of life to the point in Matthew chapter 15 that Jesus Christ, speaking on what defiles a man, said to the Pharisees, it's not what goes into the stomach that makes him unclean, but what comes out of the heart. And the book of Proverbs is just that. In fact, if you look at the book of Proverbs and where it is positioned, you know that there's 39 books in the Old Testament. So you've got 39 books in the Old Testament. And the book of Proverbs is in the middle section of five books. It's got 17 on this side and 17 on that side. The first 17 are essentially Genesis to the book of Esther. These books are the known of history. So those are your history books. Then you have from Job to Song of Songs are five books of poetry, those are known as your books of the heart. So this is your history, then your heart, and then lastly your 17 books at the end of the Old Testament in our Bibles, of which you have five books pertaining to the major prophets, which essentially are Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Isaiah formerly, and Daniel, and then you've got the 12 minor prophets. And those give you the books on hope. So you have your history, your heart, and your hope. But if you look at the book of the heart, the one in the middle, you've got Job Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Psalms. The one in the very middle is a book of Proverbs. So Proverbs is essentially the heart when the Jews came into the temple, they came through the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. Your, your outer court books, your, your history books, bring them into the temple. Your inner court books, bring them into this hope of God. And then your heart books. And essentially the book of Proverbs is like your Holy of Holies. In the innermost part, where God gives us this wisdom in how we ought to live. In fact, what's contrasting with the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Proverbs tells you how to live as a wise person. It's always contrasting the wise and the wicked, the righteous and the unrighteous, the narrow and the broad way. Later, I'll tell you my next Bible study about Jesus Christ mentioning that when he came onto the scene, Matthew 8. But also with the book of Ecclesiastes, book of Ecclesiastes is contrary to the book of Proverbs, whereas the book of Ecclesiastes speaks to you about where man sees the life as meaningless, as vanity, as uh, futile, as empty, void. So with the Lord, if we abide by his Proverbs, and they are from what Solomon, what we gather, what Solomon wrote. If you look at 1 Kings uh, 4.32, he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. And a thousand and five songs. Now what we understand is the song of songs mentioned here is one of one thousand and five. But it is the song of songs. He wrote a thousand and five songs, but the song of songs is the song of songs. And he wrote three thousand proverbs. Now of interest, how many proverbs are there in the book of Proverbs itself? The thirty-one chapters of the book of Proverbs. How many are there? Well, there's actually 800 recorded for us. So for whatever reason, the Lord thought that of the 3,000 that Solomon spoke and knew, the Lord recorded 800 of these, which is just over 25%. And 
and he recorded them for us in the book of Proverbs. And that's how many there are. So when you look at the book of Proverbs itself, it's really the heart of the matter with regards to the 39 books of the Old Testament. This is slap bang in the middle. Furthermore, you must also know that when Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, the first judgment upon Israel had already taken place. This was during the time of the book of Judges with Gideon. And I've spoken to you on Leviticus chapter 26 before, a couple of Bible studies ago, where you have these five courses of judgment upon Israel. Now when Solomon comes onto the scene, he's on the scene between the first and second judgment. The second judgment was when the kingdom was divided. They wrongly divided, if you would like, the kingdom of God in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam being Solomon's son. So between Gideon and Rehoboam, you've got this interlude here. It's an 80 year period and it's really the God giving Israel this, this, this 80 years of peace, 40 years of peace with Solomon. But 80 years where they had David who had a heart after after God. Don't, don't you wish uh, today's politicians had, had a heart after God? Okay, anything but. There's none righteous, no, not one. And Solomon, who was the son of David. And in fact, if you look at Proverbs chapter 1, 1, it actually says there, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Now, during this period is when these Proverbs are recorded for us, and the song of songs. And it speaks about the heart of the matter with regards to the Jewish people, to Israel. But in Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, it speaks about David and then the son, Solomon. And if you just go a little bit further into verse 8 and again verse 10, it says, My son, my son. So it's a father speaking to his son and giving him wisdom. If you look at the end of the book of Proverbs, which we'll get there in due course, King Lemuel gets his revelation from his mother as prophecies. So here we have a father giving instruction to his son, and later on at the end you've got a mother giving her instruction to her son, who is King Lemuel. Emmanuel means God with us, and Lemuel means God with him. When you start with the book of Proverbs, it introduces later wisdom as a female. And then it culminates in Proverbs 31 as the virtuous woman. So, if we just look at the first part that we're going to get through today, it says in Exodus chapter 4 verse 22, God calls Israel his son, his firstborn. In Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, it says, Out of Egypt I have called my son. So, essentially what the book of Proverbs is, is God the Father calling to Israel his son and instructing him, as we'll get to in a moment, with wisdom and understanding and knowledge per se, which we'll touch on those things. So, Each proverb is a, a short sentence. It's a short, wise sentence of a long experience. Something that has been experienced by the king and he's jotted it down in a short, wise sentence for his adherent, for his follower, for his son to hear. God is full of wisdom and he has enlisted, he's instructed us with these proverbs here in the book of Proverbs. 800 recorded for us the heart of the matter because out of the heart flow the issues of life so if we look at Proverbs chapter 1 verse 2 it says to know wisdom and if we can just stop there that is essentially the theme not only of chapter 1 but also the theme of the book of Proverbs is to know wisdom and instruction and to perceive the words of 
understanding. Now we know from Job 32, 8, it says, There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth forth understanding. So we receive our understanding from the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. He gives us us the understanding. More than that in a moment. It goes on in verse 3 and says, To receive the instruction of wisdom. And then it starts to list a couple of things. In fact, seven things are listed. And this is what we need to receive as instruction. So that we could have ultimately understanding. When Solomon came onto the scene, he had a, he went to dream, bed at night and he had a dream. And the Lord appeared to him in his dream. And this, I believe, is recorded for us in First Kings, early First Kings, I believe, uh, around about chapter three, I think, where it tells us that he had a dream, and the Lord asked him what he desired, and instead of him saying he desired riches or fame and fortune, but he said no, he would want wisdom, how to rule Israel. And how to judge them and he would want discretion and immediately after that dream that next morning he was challenged and he was tested and there were two harlots that came to him and they each had a child and the one child during the night had died and the mother whose child died had swapped it she had swapped her dead child with the harlot's child that was living and she pretended that the living child was now hers and her dead child was the other harlot's. So Solomon brought wisdom to the matter and said what they would do is they would bring a sword and they would cut the living child in two and each of them can take a portion. And the harlot who had the living child, whose child it was, Within her bowels, she moved and she said, No, rather let the other harlot take the child and me nothing. And through that test, Solomon knew who was the right mother. And as the story goes, the correct mother received the right child at the end of the day. But nevertheless, the, the people feared the Lord and the judgment of Solomon. So if you look here, for instance, it mentions seven things. It says, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice. So there, Solomon practiced out justice. And judgment. He actually prayed. When, when he prayed in, I believe it's 1 Kings 3, when the Lord said, like, what do you want? And 99% of the politicians today would say fame and fortune. But no, Solomon said he would want wisdom how to judge his people. So he prayed for for judgment. And to have judgment you would need to know the Ten Commandments and the Word of the Lord to judge them out of the Word of God. And the book of Proverbs is essentially the book of solutions to man's problems and man's issues. And many of man's problems and issues stem out today because they did not abide to the short, wise sentences of King Solomon, of which it must be said, David was a man after God's own heart, but Solomon, of his wisdom that he received, it said that there was none like him before and there was none like him after. So, during this respite period in Leviticus chapter 26, when it speaks about the first course and the second course of judgment upon Israel, between the first and the second, you have David and Solomon there during this respite period because of the statue of, the statue of these men. Of God. God held back his judgment. You know, I'm reminded where he says to us, by the prayers of one righteous man availeth much. So you just need one righteous man, and it can change history. It can change the very things. It can, it can halt God's judgment. It can, it can do many things. But but um, moving on, it speaks about uh, equity. And with that story that held out with the two harlots, that you see the equity where he was he was partial in that he was going to give 50-50, half the child here, half the child there. 
Okay, so just don't show favoritism. Be careful when you show favoritism, especially if you're a parent. Don't show favoritism. It's a very foolish thing to do as a parent. To show any sort of favoritism between one child and another. Those children are your inheritance. Be careful how you treat them. As time will go, those children may have to look after you one day. And how have you treated them? A mystery to them. Remember when Jacob showed Joseph favor. What was the end result? Well, the brothers colluded with one another to kill him. Only by God's grace did Joseph survive his ordeal. But essentially, it would come to that. They, 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 they conspired and they connived to kill the own flesh and blood because of favoritism. I'm reminded by Proverbs 31 30, it says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So the virtuous woman. One that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Fame is deceitful. Beauty is vain. You can be beautiful today and you, and you can fade tomorrow like a flower. Don't hold on to physical things. But hold on to the things of God. Fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you'll be praised according to the book of Proverbs 31.30. It goes on and it tells us to give subtlety in verse 4. Subtlety to the simple. So subtlety is prudence, it's cleverness, it's been, it's been wise in your time and with what is coming. The wicked flee where no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Being prudent, which is linked to a word that's coming up shortly, to the young man knowledge and discretion. Discretion, I looked in the Webster's Dictionary, and it mentions being prudent, showing discretion, having discernment. Remember, Solomon prayed for discernment, knowing right and wrong, knowing good and bad. Isaiah, in Isaiah 5, says there'll come a time and they'll call right, wrong, wrong, right, good, bad, bad, good, bitter, sweet, sweet, bitter. So they'll, and that's what you're living in that time at the moment. People don't even know what the agenda what the agenda is. They're confused. Jesus Christ said, and God created the male and female. But today there is mass confusion. Because they don't have understanding. They lack the very thing that we receive from the inspiration of the Almighty. So these seven things are laid out for us. So it mentions wisdom in verse 2, justice, judgment, equity. Those are four. And in verse 4, subtlety, knowledge, and discretion. Now just with those seven, those seven are the building blocks to understanding. If you want understanding, you need each of those seven active in your life. On wisdom and knowledge and understanding, I've mentioned to this before on this channel, but I'll mention it again. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The difference between the three is this. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the application of those facts. And understanding is the assortment of those facts. So they're all working tandem. Knowledge is accumulating facts. Wisdom is applying them. And understanding is assorting them. Knowing what goes with what. So I know many Bible teachers and preachers out there. I know reverence. And I know all sorts. They have knowledge of the scriptures. They have wisdom in applying the scriptures. But not all of them have understanding. Whereas they don't rightly divide the word of truth. As we are called to do in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself a proof unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. They don't rightly divide. So they mismatch. They put things for Israel into the body of Christ. And vice versa. And they're confused. They don't have understanding. They've got knowledge. But knowledge pops up. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. So you can't only have knowledge. They've got wisdom. It says in Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom. But in all you're getting, get understanding. 
So understanding is at the core. Wisdom is just one of the building blocks to get understanding. Like knowledge, like equity, like judgment, like justice, like discretion, or, or discernment, or being prudent. All those things are building blocks. They're like Jenga building blocks. But if you haven't got understanding, then your, your, your tower, your, your Jenga tower that you're building, is going to look like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So in all you're getting, Proverbs 4, 7, get understanding. It goes on and says, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So we know from Proverbs 15, 22, it says, In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. So when we're looking for wisdom in a matter, it's good for us to go and ask two or three people because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let your word be admonished, the scriptures tell us. So it's good to source two or three people to give us the wisdom. But ultimately, to attain understanding, we need those seven building blocks. And once we receive understanding, then we are like those wise counselors. That can give wise, accurate, important wisdom, knowledge, justice, equity, judgment, discretion, at a time when people need it most. Be like the men of Issachar, the Bible tells us, that knew the times in which they lived. So we live in a time when people are confused. They don't even know what their identity is. They don't know what their gender is. Simple, basic things. Because they don't have understanding. And why don't they have understanding? Because they're not seeking after God's own heart. They're not acquiring knowledge of His Scriptures. The Word tells us study. They're not studying the Word of God. They're devoid of the Word of God. They're not keeping to the book of Proverbs and adhering to these 800 Proverbs that are written out for us and recorded for us in the book of Proverbs. The middle book of the Old Testament, the heart of hearts, the Holy of Holies, for us, because out of there, it tells us, Proverbs 4, is it 4.23? 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of there flow the issues of life. It's not what goes into the stomach that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of a heart that defiles you. And then it goes on and tells us there in verse 6, the last verse that we're looking at this morning, to understand the proverb and the interpretation. So having understanding gives you the ability to understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. And another word for dark sayings is parables. And Jesus Christ, as you know, he came on the scene, he spoke in parables, he spoke in dark sayings, and only the disciples understood it because he interpreted the parables for them. So, as I bring this to a close, we understand that these Proverbs that are written in the Old Testament, if you rightly divide the Word of God today, the body of Christ can exude wisdom out of these Proverbs in how we ought to live. But essentially, primarily, they are written to Israel, Israel is God's son, my son who I've called out of Egypt, my son who is my firstborn, book of Exodus, book of Hosea, tell us. Whenever God is speaking about Israel as the nation, as the people, He addresses them as my son. When God speaks about the land, He speaks about it as her, as feminine. For instance, in Jeremiah 3, 8, it says, Backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. In Deuteronomy 11, 17, it says, The land is defiled. God vomited her inhabitants out. And lastly, in Psalm 85, 12, it tells us, The land shall heal her increase. And this is very important to understand because we get the latter parts 
of the book of Proverbs, you know that when it's talking about the sun, it's talking about Israel, the people, the nation, and when it's talking about the land, it's fundamentally, and I'll touch on this when we get into our next lesson, it's speaking about the bride, this city, holy city, heavenly Jerusalem that comes out of heaven, dawn as a bride. Her. So you get the, the him and the her, the nation and the land. And those things are mentioned. But we'll touch more on that. Next one we'll look at is the ways. There is a way that seems right unto a man. The book of Proverbs contrasts the broad way and the narrow way. And a um, lot much more we can talk about there. So I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior. And I say thank you in Jesus' name.